welcome, Heather, again. Thank you. So we're on this mission of working with Heather and Jen. Is it Jen or Jen? I can have it. Yeah. Jen. Um, in terms of Priya and doing a deep dive, and we have cleared the benches here. <laughs> They've always been packed. But we've been working with Heather and Jen to um, do a broad overview of this, which we've done. And then we're getting into the individual topics within Korea. We did the auditing uh, process a few days ago. And uh, today we're doing the reporting and investigating uh, situations or allegations. And next week, we're going to get into uh, some other topics as well within Korea. And Phil may have been in contact with you or not, but you've sent us that list. And we're working right off that list in the order that you sent it to us. Okay. So, issues. so we're scheduling you in next week for a few, a few days. <coughs> a few days? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> not in a row. Downtime, and also we're going to be tied up a little bit next week with budget address from the governor and some work on the floor. So, if you could, you and Jen could just connect with Phil after we finish up this morning, and we can solidify that. So, welcome. It feels good to be. We can breathe. <laughs> Elbow room called Daniel Bone. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel Bone. So, Heather, welcome. And uh, why don't we just go to the room here and John doesn't have to do anything. So, Jen, just introduce yourself. And yep. Morning, Jen Spratke, Prison Rape Elimination Act Director for the department. Jenny? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're just introducing ourselves. I know. What name are you going to use today? <laughs> Virginia Redford and Satsa Redford Consulting, and they work with the Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Yeah. I'm Steve Howard of the Vermont State Employees Association. Thank you. Heather, it's all yours. Okay, my name is Heather Simons. I'm the Director of Training and Professional Development for the Department of Corrections. Thank you for having me. Good to see you again. <laughs> we haven't got any work. I know. You can't miss me if I don't go away for a while, right? So uh, what we have been doing um, is um, trying to sequence the topics in order um, that make practical sense, but also allow um, for the committee questions, which have been um, very thoughtful and uh, have has assisted us in um, figuring out which way to go. In other, in other words, we probably, frankly, I probably wouldn't have started with audits, but having done that is a good idea, I think, in hindsight, to go to the end and then um, go frontwards from there. This Prius standards and focus that you see up on the screen is um, quite literally a cheat sheet, which Jen. Put, uh, she didn't put it together for us, but she had access to it. And based on the questions the committee has had, this might be useful for folks um, because it's quite a bit shorter. It, what it does is it outlines the exact number in the standards of the topic that you're looking at. And as you see, it begins with investigations. I'm not going to go through this whole thing line by line for you. It's very reader friendly. Um, what I would like to do is um, pick up where we left off on Tuesday with regards to the major topics that have to do with the standards, and that is that um, the Elimination Act is there to address prevention, detection, investigation, and accountability. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion with regards to the importance of prevention. We refer to things like um, inmate education and staff training and how we need to understand um, really the, what the, the spirit of what all this is about and that is uh, that's a key component of prevention and uh, additionally where I left off was how, how our staff are being trained in terms of seeing and identifying behavior measuring behavior intervening and using what we call the behavior continuum um, the behavior continuum is um, part of our advanced communication techniques uh, we deliver it at the academy for new recruits 
and recertify in it um, annually for uh, facility staff. And how that's connected to reporting and investigating is it's one of the first steps in um, competency-based skills that assist our staff in identifying um, concerning behavior. So not everything is sexual behavior, not everything is dangerous behavior, but we can say that when uh, we see things that are out of the norm, quote unquote, out of the norm in a facility, we need to identify it and it goes into a concerning box. So, for, so, so before you go any further, yeah. if, the, if you go back up to the top, you know, mm -hmm. you've got investigations and then you got 115 dead. Point seventy one one fifteen one seven one. Yeah. Are those the number of your directives that in, that indicate these specific items? No. These. What, is, what does that? These numbers refer to the numbers in the standards that Eric reviewed on the first day. So those are the federal. Right. Mm -hmm. When we get to Sections. legal implications, you're going to see um, all you're going to see all the relevant directives related to that, comp that that next step, and I don't remember where the legal implications was, maybe three or four down on the list. I can't remember. So recall. that would be next week. Probably. For your directives, mm -hmm. because for DOC, the PREA standards that are set on the federal level with the, with the Prison Rape Elimination Act, we carry that out on the state level. Mm -hmm. And DOC does that through their internal directives. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that would be for staff, that would be for inmates that have issues. It lays out what the process is. It's not done through administrative rules, LCOR. It is done within the Department of Corrections with their directives. The directives do have a public process to them. Correct. But it's more decisions are made and decided more internally than having LCAR in or having to abide by legislative intent of a state statute. Yes, thank you for clarifying. The directives are designed to, to essentially guide the staff person. And in most cases, if you are, you know, if you're in the weeds in your everyday duties, you're pretty much going to know what directives you're essentially going to have memorized um, and then there if if there are areas outside of what your everyday duties are then you have access to those directives there is a PREA directive there's an investigations directive there are searches directives you're going to find that with regards to um, the topics underneath under the Prison Rape Elimination Act pretty much every directive in some way or another We could link back to best practices mm -hmm. or safe and secure practices. We're not going to bring every directive in here pro uh, promise Well um, the uh, the detection component of the PREA standards has to do with what are what are we training our staff to look for what are they seeing, and um, how do we collect more information? The detection piece is very important because of the nuances of um, being a resident in a confined environment. It may um, behavior is different, and circumstances are different. When I first uh, started doing this work over well over a, a decade ago, maybe 15 years, we um, I attended. Um, uh, American University Washington College of Law certification for staff sexual misconduct and at that time they had uh, developed um, what was called the daily dozen which was a self checklist for staff who needed to we needed to start training ourselves and what to look for in terms of our personal experiences in a facility as well as red flags and warning signs which I'll show you um, no, I won't show you those. Mm -hmm. No problem. <laughs> they won't show us. I so will send them to you. Yeah, send them to Phil. And I have a very healthy memory of them, so it won't get in the way of the learning. Uh, the daily dozen was 12. Basically, what do I ask myself when I go into um, a facility and I'm working there and signs that I need to pay attention to in terms of uh, me becoming vulnerable to making bad decisions or making mistakes. The red flags and warning signs was a list that was about, it was maybe about 30 
subjects long at the time, and that was to train staff and administrators and what we need to look for in staff who may not be seeing that they're getting in the weeds somehow, becoming vulnerable, or making mistakes. And the, uh, the design of this entire t uh, competency was around um, uh, basically boundaries and undue familiarity. Because of the conditions of working in a facility and because you're doing a lot of time there, um, and, not, and I'm not talking about folks serving a sentence, I mean <laughs> over time, um, we become accustomed, because we're humans, to wanting to build relationships. So if you're in a unit day after day, it may be that you're beginning to build a rapport with an offender. And there are a lot of different ways to describe behavior um, and the dynamics of building a rapport. And it's a, it can be, quite frankly, a slippery slope between gaining cooperation, establishing a professional rapport, and crossing boundaries where um, although nothing dangerous has happened, it could lead to something dangerous. So we start using words, uh, words like grooming, for example. We know when we look backwards on staff sexual misconduct cases, and I'm speaking generally, although um, Vermont has not been immune to these kinds of situations, we know that um, there's a difference, not always, but in most cases with female staff um, and male inmates it's going to look a little like uh, the woman falls in love. And in, um, in the opposite case, with, uh, with the female inmates and um, male staff, it's going to look a little more predatory. And again, I'm generalizing, but I want to give you a profile of the cases and the things that we've learned along the way. Also, I can't say this enough, there, we have kind of a public image that this is always a male correctional officer and a female inmate, and it's just not shown. The numbers do not reflect that. I say it because it's hard to kind of break that thinking habit, but also because I have a very deep respect for our workforce and the department, and um, I want to make sure that I put on the record regularly that in most, in most cases, we have dedicated, committed, trained, um, officers and caseworkers and administrative staff doing what they need to do. There are times though where um, this isn't the case and the security risks attached to this kind of behavior can um, run very deep in a facility and also can start in a way that are really uh, quite subtle if we don't look for it. In terms of these red flags and warning signs it could look like things like someone um, Someone who normally doesn't volunteer for overtime is volunteering for overtime all the time. It can show up in things like the way that um, we use language. So if I was working in a male facility, I might refer to my guy. He's my guy. I know he hasn't been feeling well. It just could be as subtle as that, that um, I'm not referring to all the other men in the unit that way, but one in particular might be my guy could be a change in routine. <coughs> Am I volunteering to, to work sections of the facility that I wouldn't normally want to work? And that does, does that mean that every time these kinds of things happen that there's something up? Absolutely not. But it is, they are subtle enough and in some ways and concerning enough in other ways that it's just an invitation to ask the question, what might be happening? So let me interrupt you there. Mm -hmm. If that is occurring, within a facility, male or female facility, male or female correctional officer. Who, who would notice that and, and where would that person go to relay that information? Say, I'm a little concerned when I'm seeing this. What's, what's the process? That's a great question. So, for example, when I, you know, when I say someone's volunteering to help out in a different duty than they usually do, that's a strength-based, positive thing to do, and so it's not really suspicious. Mm -hmm. And we need to connect it with other things that might be happening. And we don't want to jump the gun, because that's not fair either. It's really, we need to support a workforce that is, as you know, um, very often very new and not very seasoned. And so there needs to be some latitude for learning and coaching and men mentoring. We have a ways to go there, and we understand that. So I know I'm not totally asking, answering your question, but 
once it's, it hits the level, and this is subjective of concerning, I think, you know, but the where does it hit that level? Is it at the case supervisor level? Is it the superintendent level? Is it at other correctional officers that are there on that same unit? Is it coming from the inmate saying, wait a minute here? I mean, where where is that, those warning signals, where is that mm -hmm. being sent to? Who is sending it? Where is it being sent to? Okay, let me go, let me go back. I think this might help. Let me go backwards from there. Let's take a look at. Um, let's for, let's take a look at example like Danamora. <clears throat> there are others, but that is one that's just very glaring, and we all know, and it was close to home. Um, what we know about these cases that really go south, and that is about as south as a case can go. Um, what we tend to find out is many more people knew that something was up but didn't say anything. And it's not always that people don't say anything because they're not willing to be cooperative or because uh, they're dishonest, but we tend to work in isolated situations. So if there's a personnel investigation going on, we may not know all the other pieces. So if I go to work and I see Jen Spracky and now she's wearing jewelry and she didn't used to wear jewelry and now and or maybe she has one earring in, or now she's wearing eyeshadow and makeup and she didn't used to wear makeup, I'm not gonna um, automatically think that she's having a sexual relationship with an inmate. But it is one of many warning signs Then when you piece together, they get pieced together, sometimes in hindsight, you're like, oh, right. She was dressing to come in to see somebody. This does not mean that, I, mean, I I have to be very careful when I deliver this content and training because um, I don't want to cause unnecessary panic. So it, it gets pieces together with other things that might, um, that might us, lead us to believe that something, a question should be asked, not necessarily that something is going on. Again, if we look at something like Danamora, what we see is that um, it wasn't just a couple of people that knew something was happening. What's her name? Joyce Mitchell, right? So yes. Joyce Mitchell did an interview with Matt Lauer, and this is in all the reports, but Matt Lauer is the fastest way to look at it. He, she was, he was doing an interview with her, and um, he was basically asking her what happened. And her words were, I, I, was, I was known for being really nice. I guess I was just too nice. And in a, in a corrections environment, too nice is dangerous. Too nice pretty much implies that you are crossing boundaries and giving things that you shouldn't be giving. And it starts it with it starts with small things like cookies and brownies and shampoo and then maybe it's a cigarette and then maybe it's a cell phone and then maybe it's seven hacksaws which I believe she brought in. Right? So it is progressive and it's this level of of grooming that is the dynamic and profile of staff sexual so, misconduct. So who did the grooming? Was it the correctional officer in that case that did the grooming, or was it the inmate that was grooming the correctional officer? Well, that's where it gets very interesting. So the male inmate was doing the grooming, the grooming of the female staff person. That's, and quite frankly, I mean, she's not, she was not convicted of staff sexual exploitation. She was convicted of, um, um, I don't remember the exact charges, but it was her behavior in terms of assisting with the escape. The public does not always see women as the offender, though in fact she is the staff person and responsible, but the perception was that she was the victim of their manipulation. And manipulation is a word that we, um, we don't train to. We don't train to manipulation in Vermont, and when our recruits use the word, I was manipulated or if we hear in training anyone saying women are manipulative, we don't endorse it as a training word unless, of course, our staff are willing to say, when you say she manipulated you, you are saying to us that you were outsmarted. And that does not fly with our staff. And it wouldn't fly with me. But what but the idea over time in terms of the last 15 years of this work is that there, we had to undo the thinking with regards to what particularly women 
offenders were um, able to get away with. She was too sexual. She was flirting with me. She lured me. That's not the case, and with an imbalance of power, we always have the power. So if we've been manipulated, then when we, and we go backwards from manipulation, what we see is someone who was compromised or made a legit mistake but wasn't willing to admit it. Those are, the, those are the two areas that we have to train to in terms of our competency skills. If you are following the rules, if you are doing your job, you are not being manipulated. If you've made a mistake, and you know you've made a mistake, and it's turned into something more, which often happens, so I didn't do my checks properly, and I lie about them, on, I lie about them in the log, for example, it would have been easier if I just said I didn't <coughs> meet my check. Because in the case of Dan Moore, I believe there were something like um, 400 searches that did not happen that could have caught that, those holes that were uh, being put in the wall. So in terms of um, staff sexual misconduct, those tentacles, again, they go everywhere. Because once you start, uh, once you start crossing the line in terms of boundary violations, other people have to get in on it. Because someone's got to see something at some point. This is part of the detection piece. There's nothing to report until there's something to report, which is why it's so important that we all work together to look for the things that might give us a tip that, some, that something's happening. And again, it's equally important that we're vigilant about this because of the perception that our population doesn't tell the truth. We have to work even harder and we've been fighting that perception for some time. Because you're incarcerated, then you automatically are not believable. So collecting evidence on these, or preserving evidence on these cases is even trickier, which is why we need to train to those competency skills around making observations, watching behavior, and noticing things that um, might not normally happen. So when I referred to the behavior continuum the other day, um, where we'd say someone who's usually really chatty isn't talking anymore, we need to ask what's happening. Does that necessarily lead to a sexualized um, behavior? No, but we need to ask and find out what it is. So, I guess I'm still going back to that question. Uh, it's a little bit different depending on the situation. So maybe we're getting into an area here that's a little too dicey. <laughs> <clears throat> but within a correctional facility, there appears to be something other staff is detecting something is going on with either one of their colleagues with an inmate or <coughs> an inmate with one of their colleagues. What is the responsibility? of that colleague, that staff, those staff members that are seeing this of their colleague. What's their responsibility? Where did they go? <coughs> do they go anywhere? Or does it stay within, within that little confine of the officers that are staffing that unit or in that facility? What, in the ideal world, what would be the process? And in reality, what is the process? <coughs> You see what I'm saying? Yeah, the ideal world is that we are, that again, we're cultivating a corrections culture where people are talking and asking questions and not afraid to ask questions or show that maybe they don't know what to do. And that we also are in a coaching and mentoring culture where we're picking up, we're, we're really keeping our eye on new folks, for example, and making sure that they get the information that they need when we see something that maybe we just, there's so much to learn. They come out of the academy and they have um, so much on their mind that they have to do, and the pace of the facility can be really fast. But the obligation is, once you see something, then you say something. You just got to know what it is. We don't always know what it is. Just because someone's- but who would they say it to? Well, each, they, if, if there's something, I'm sorry <coughs> if I'm missing your if question. If they're seeing something between one of their colleagues, an officer, and an inmate going on, mm -hmm and another correctional officer on staff with them is seeing something. Mm -hmm. 
Where does that correctional officer? The supervisor. And, uh, to the case super, to the supervisor of the facility. Mm -hmm. But not limited to, right? So let's say it is your supervisor. Okay. You now can go. Doing the, mm -hmm. You can go above your supervisor. Um, there's no rule that says you can't talk to another colleague and say, I'm seeing this. This is concerning. What should I do? But the it, I think, is where I was getting jammed up. If the it is, you know, I see Jen hanging around inmate Jones's cell all the time whispering, I should be reporting that. And we are training that that should be reported. We don't have to know anything else other than that. What's intimidating is that when we don't know what we see, I mean, this, this is the reality. This is very, it, this is daunting for new staff. I don't want to be the guy who goes and reports Jen every time she has a conversation. This is why we have expanded this content to include all the warning signs that we have picked, we have learned and collected over the years in terms of behaviors that might be um, worthy of a question. Am I getting closer? So there was a report down to the supervisor mm -hmm. from a correctional officer about conservative behavior of another correctional officer towards an inmate. It could be sexualized, but not sure. Mm -hmm. Just the warning signs for that. What does that supervisor then do? Well, this is where the variables can go a lot. I mean, depending on what the st what's actually happening and what the story is. So it's completely benign. It would probably be um, verbal feedback from the supervisor to, to the staff person. That I not see, the one yeah. who reported it, but the one that was behaving, exhibiting some sort of different behavior. Yeah. So um, Jen's, hanging, Jen's hanging around that cell all the time, and I'm just a supervisor. It's quite likely that I'm going to say, why are you talking to inmate Jones twice a day? What are you whispering about? I might just ask, what's happening? That would, that's what should happen in an ideal world. Just ask, what's going on? And I'm going to find out what's going on. Or I'm going to be lied to. Or um, they needed medical attention. Or the person who said that I was, Jen was talking to him all the time misunderstood what they saw. So that's what I mean, Mike. It could go in many different directions. It doesn't necessarily mean... When someone, when an officer is showing that they care, it doesn't necessarily mean they're up to something. That's right. why this is extremely particular work around making sure that if we're in the right direction, we're in a trust environment where we can flush that stuff out without panicking. So let's carry that the next step. Mm -hmm. So the, sit, the supervisor, I'm not going to say shit supervisor, <laughs> 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 then reported to the supervisor. And a supervisor has a conversation with the officer that is exhibiting behavior. And as the supervisor really feels that there's something valid there, what's the next step? Where does that supervisor then go? I don't know. Don't know. I don't know because I don't dare. I, I don't dare speculate. Not because. Okay. Um, it depends. You know. Again. That is what I'm talking about one conversation between an officer and No, but and I'm inmate. saying it's beyond that one conversation. I mean, there's other things that it really looks like there is something. It could be the boundaries are really getting mushed and they're not, there's something there. The, the supervisor really realizes there is something there. Yeah. Where there's, does that then go? In, from, in a formal sense, officially? I can't say, but I, you know, I have eyes on this situation, right? So now I'm watching more closely. Would they go to you, the PREA folks, or would they go to the superintendent? No, because that's not a PREA case yet. It's two people having a conversation. What makes it become a PREA case? Well, okay. <laughs> trying to figure out which <clears throat> there's um here's one example um a case a caseworker was seen having um, a lot of meetings 
with an inmate. And um, in and of itself, um, just seemed like a lot of why so many meetings, which caused pause and folks are um, advised up the chain, um, caseworker so-and-so meets a lot with inmate so-and-so. I'll look into it. I, uh, it's looked into and we find out that inmate had it, you know, needed some extra time and was having trouble at home. Again, that's still benign. Later on, um, these meetings continue, but now there's um, uh, like flip chart paper or paper up over the office window where you can't see, you can't see in. Still, there's nothing to prove, but this is suspicious and concerning, so it gets addressed, it gets addressed again. And um, feedback is you can't, you cannot be covering a window, take, you know, take the paper down. So from a performance perspective, I can't tell you exactly, because now we're getting into things like evaluations. But in, generally speaking, um, we would be upping the ante in terms of the serious, of seriousness of this. But still, this does not mean that there's a sexual relationship happening. It could be one of many things. We just know that it's not right, it's not professional, and we need to look into it. Um, The meetings continue, and now there are two two different inmates that are now meeting in this office regularly, not just one, and that's concerning. There's some oversharing in a group that's observed by another staff person simultaneously during the same time. That's concerning, and that gets reported. We're hovering now in a place where we need to look into something, and an investigation, and a conversation has to happen. From there, what is discovered that um, there are drawings in the desk of the um, caseworker that the inmates have been, um, one in particular had been drawing of her. And um, they were very personal. With further inquiry, we find out that she is working on weekends <coughs> uh, to uh, quote unquote catch up on her casework. Then further inquiry, we find out that um, he had been writing uh, letters to her children, and he was convicted of sex offenses against children. It's, it's not just one thing, and so I can't really answer your question. It could be that there are regu two, uh, um, maybe three meetings instead of one with a caseworker than inmate, because there's some legitimate problems that need to be discussed, and that does happen, but in this particular case, it was eyes on, and in that case, there was a relationship between the caseworker and the inmate, and it was um, very concerning. The, um, the, uh, we've had cases with uh, clinicians and with nurses, and I'm going back a ways, but um, this is a little easier to spot, but an inmate might be visiting the same nurse uh, more often. Did I do that? No, it goes no. off. Okay. <laughs> it's not scrolling. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not it's not a little off. You're broken. Thank you. Um, I don't feel good all the time, so I'm going to see nurse so and so. This wasn't. If this is harder, that's a legitimate. If you don't feel good, then you go to medical and you're seen. And so there's nothing really. Thank you. Go. There's nothing really to spot there. In that particular case, um, there was never really anything until she didn't show up for work. And she didn't show up for work for a couple days. So they did a welfare check, and this is after he maxed out, and he raped her over four times on the way to Springfield, Mass, where he left her for dead. They found her because she didn't go to work. But she had been, what she said was, in love. And um, continued that relationship after he maxed out. But there wasn't really anything to say, see, or pick up on that we saw that was on the books after this. He asked for regular visits to see the nurse. So those boundary violations, sometimes they happen and we don't see them, but they're just small signs that we have.
to look after. There wasn't anything to report in that particular case. Do you have a question? I do. So, Heather, <coughs> excuse me, you were talking about an instance of somebody covered in a piece of paper, piece mm -hmm. of paper, uh, with an inmate. So, who can report? Who can report that they see something that doesn't look right? Anyone. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Could be an inmate, could be an officer, could be a... Mm -hmm. So I'm, I want to think a little bit about the officer-officer culture. Um, so I walk by and I see this piece of paper over there and I feel like, you know, okay, and I don't do anything uh, because I know the person that's in there. So it's just like, you know, it's, it's okay. Um, the next person walks by and does the same thing. And then these two people get together and say, I don't forget about it. Mm -hmm. It's walker room stuff. It's walker room stuff, yeah. Uh, if, and if, so if a, sup if a supervisor, whether it be a CO2 or a shift supervisor or a uh, superintendent, assistant superintendent, doesn't know about it, how does it move forward when those things begin to happen if, if it becomes uh, a network mm -hmm. that's not right not doing the work it's supposed to do we talked about the culture and when I came back in here. So mm -hmm. what that, th that's so that is I mean that's at the heart of this right is creating the culture. If the superintendent doesn't know that's concerning. And again to go back um, you know in the ideal world we're all operating off the same page. And you walk by a door that has paper up on the window, you just open the door. You know that's not right, take it down. That's the idea that, that it doesn't go on. Um, when it does go on and we look backwards after these, you know, after these incidents, what we see is um, pr uh, always pretty much what we call a sexualized work environment in these big cases. And there's been some very big ones in this country where um, at the end of the day, there were always boundary violations, there was always undue familiarity, and there was almost always sex. They found the same thing with the um, Mississippi Commissioner, Chris Epps, who is now serving 20 years. And it's for kickbacks and violations on private contracts with, um, is it MCI? But again, once they really dug into this, they saw the same kind of thing, which is a culture where it seems like everybody knows isn't doing anything. What happens is sometimes people are reporting, but you, once you report behavior that's misconduct, you're not allowed to know what happens next. Our personnel process is set up in that way. So if it's, it, it may well be being investigated, but you wouldn't know that. It could be that 10 people are reporting it, and the 10 people don't know that each other has reported it. It could be that no one's reported and everyone thought someone else did. But these are the dynamics that can happen, which is why it's important to, to get it a lot earlier. The training has to do with the things that we might, we need to watch each other and we also need to watch the residents. It's residents in terms of change in behavior, change in requests, it could be anything with the residents. It could be um, um, not sleeping, refusing to shower, that's a very important sign. If you're not going, if you're too afraid to go to the shower, we, we should have our eyes on that. And uh, um, historically, and we historically we would just think you're not clean, and you don't smell good, and that's annoying. We might direct you, order you to the shower. And I'm going back a long ways, but these are things that we would want we want to pay attention to in a much more compassionate way than we did 25 years ago, for example. Sure. But you say we, but not all we's are the same. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, <coughs> and, yeah, how do you, you know, I put the colloquial expression is the old boys network. How, how do you break that? It doesn't matter if it's not employees or, or whatever, or even inmates. How do you mm -hmm. work to break that up? And, is, and if you, something happens and you, you can't track it back because nobody's, Well, if I really had the magic pill, I... 
I'd be popular, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, what we understand um, through National Institute of Corrections and through doing all these case studies with incidents is that we can't do one thing at a time. It must come from the top, a zero tolerance policy and a message from leadership that this is who we are now. And um, I, I know I keep continue to refer to a sexualized work environment, but that's key. And what that means is that it may not be sexual assault that's happening in the unit, but if you are, if you are making sexual jokes, if you're being inappropriate, if you're saying things um, that are unprofessional and uh, demeaning to each other as staff, the population hears you and you have now disabled their faith in you. They hear you that this is okay behavior. So that is, um, we're very serious about tackling that. If that's not addressed, there's nothing for them to model after. So sharing information, we shouldn't be sharing information with the population. And that happens sometimes, and that happens because we get tripped up. If you're working 16 hours and seeing the same people over and over again, you may not notice that someone just asked me when my birthday is, or if I had a good weekend. And that's the beginning of the slippery slope. So, maybe I've got a theory. <coughs> superintendent or a supervisor and I see something that's somebody says something right I see somebody not doing what they're supposed to do as an employee or people are supervising and I think boy if I if I get if I get this person they have to have six days off or whatever. But yeah we don't have anybody to fill fill the spot while we're down. I mean, we, my folks are already working 10, 12, 14 hour shifts. Does that lack of personnel have a could that lack of person have anything to do with the decision making that's being done? Human nature, I, I, just, I don't know. But could it? We are properly staffed if you have less incidents of this type of problem. That's a very intimidating question. I, I don't know what you can answer. <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> that is. We didn't Sorry, text I anything. Mean. <laughs> I, I have no knowledge of anyone ever saying to me in my career, I let so-and-so slide because I don't have enough staff. The second part of the question was, if we had enough staff, would we have less of these cases? Quite possibly because we have enough staff which means more eyes on, um, uh, more relief in terms of overtime, and all the things that come with having uh, um, more staffing. And of course, um, staffing is a major part of uh, the PREA push, which is you need to have a lot of people paying attention to this. Close enough. I promise I'm not trying to. Um, I, I knew it was an unanswerable question. Do we know the answer before we ask? Yeah. yeah. I kind of knew that too. We have a couple more questions. <laughs> Felicia, then her. So anybody can report. Mm -hmm. Who was able to start an investigation? And who specifically in the facility starts the investigation? A superintendent would request an investigation. So it has to go all the way past shift supervisor up to the superintendent to, to start an investigation. Yeah. So if nothing ever gets past a shift supervisor, no investigations are started. Well, I think, so there's, can you say more about what kind of incident you're talking about? I'm speaking generally. If an inmate came to me as a CO and mm -hmm. said, hey, there's been X concerning behavior. I don't think it's right. What's the X concerning behavior? Uh, that's between an, another inmate and a CO. Doing? Being too friendly. Just, hey, I see concerning behavior. Let's say it's just that big. Okay. That's a very good question. So, because inmates may not want to get themselves in trouble with the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. Everybody's always concerned about blowback. Yeah. If a CO only has, hey, from an inmate, hey, 
Inmate X and COX have been doing some concerning stuff. You should look into it. And that's it. That's all you got. Well, you're supposed to report that. So you go to your shift supervisor and you say, hey, I don't know how credible it is. I don't know what's going on. I don't have a lot of information. But Inmate X told me that this is happening. And they kind of go, well, there's nothing to go on. Have a nice day. Thank you. That doesn't start an investigation because that doesn't go up to the superintendent. The shift supervisor has the judgment to say, there's not enough there to work with. We can't really do anything with that. Thank you for letting me know. Is that kind of an accurate play are how something could happen? Ask you, are you still asking me a question? Yeah, it's okay. to be crystal clear, I think that a lot of our cultural inside the facility issues about reporting and we're not finding out about things until way after the fact. We're not finding out that or we're not able to prevent things because we're not looking into them until they've reached a certain point. I think comes solely because it has to escalate to a level through staff and through behavior. It has to escalate to a level in which the superintendent is involved and has to call for investigation. And I think there's a lot in that minutia that's going to get lost traveling up. And that that could be a contributing factor to the fact that we go back and say everybody is supposed to report. We're always supposed to be looking for this behavior. And the fact of the matter is, when somebody might come and say this is concerning or this behavior is upsetting, it's not going anywhere. And it's not because the investigation stalled it, because there was no investigation. I mean, there's, there's... So what you're saying, it didn't hit a level of triggering an investigation. There yeah. All the, the reporting of, it was really gray areas. So then the supervisor made those decisions. Never got up to a higher level, whatever that higher level is, to do a formal investigation so that it stays within that swamp, yeah. that soup, and whatever I, you want to say. That and going to Butch's point of how do you kind of break up old boys club, that kind of culture that we're talking about, those complaints that get lost in that quagmire. How are we addressing that besides saying everybody's supposed to report something? Because quite clearly it's obvious that we're in a situation where that has failed us. And it, I, I think we seriously have to ask, who's starting investigations? At what point is Priya involved in staff's behavioral reviews? And who's able to stop or disregard a complaint? Because if, if we can't answer those three questions and convey that to our inmates and convey that to our COs, we are not doing a single thing to actually change the behavior that's happening. And I think that is incredibly frustrating for me personally. I'd, I'd love to hear if there's anything that you can share with me about if, if any of those are something that we can address. Because I think you mentioned before that Pre is not involved in staff reviews, performance reviews. If you have a caseworker that's got paper up on their door, to use your example, and that's reported, and they just say, hey, you know that's not the rules, don't do that. That's, that's a, a staffing issue. That's not a involving two people complaint going up issue. So maybe we can kind of structure this to really focus in. You've got people who are <coughs> papers on the door, we report that, then things escalate. Are there incident reports that occur? If it's a higher level? I think actually level, putting think. putting paper up on an office door probably is an incident. It's right. It would be it definitely would be performance. Right? But are there formal incident reports that are submitted to the supervisor or the superintendent? Yes. Incident report from other correctional officers or whomever. 
So yes. that is a formal process within DOC? For incidents, yes. For incidents, and what would those incidents be? Like an altercation between inmates or? All kinds, yeah, all, all kinds. kinds of so it's really behavior. broad, but mm -hmm. in terms of a grooming behavior, are there incident reports for that? No. Should there be? I, I am trying to, to say this in a way I can't do it. I'm just going to speak the way I can, which is I don't want, I, it would very, be very hard for me to work for a Department of Corrections where I was going to be reported for having two conversations instead of one that day. What I'm talking about is behavior that when you put them all together might be indicating that something else is going on. And um, we have to give some latitude, because remember, we're not talking about the majority of our staff. The majority of our staff, respectfully, are professional and kind and compassionate. They're skilled and thorough. They are trained and skilled in writing and report writing and tracking. And they are very good at rapid assessment in terms of putting together inmate behavior quickly and watching it long term. So, um, I'm t in these cases, that those these are not the majority of the cases. I don't want to, to go to a place where we start writing people up for having an extra meeting or spending extra time. But there may be, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not in the whole personnel world. There may be some cases where there are other things happening at the same time. That's not uncommon. So there might be some performance stuff in other areas. And I know that's, I, I, I know I'm not totally getting where you were going, but in the, in the end, um, there wasn't really, was there a specific question or something for us to know? I think there is a serious lack of transparency and accountability in lower staff, and that is why there is a disregard for complaints or concerns, and that's why we're not getting the reporting. And it's fine to say after the fact, all of these behaviors, from handing out a cookie to handing out a hacksaw, led up to this. But if we can't identify those in real time inside our facilities, we're protecting no one. Not our staff, not our inmates. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I'm doing right by my workforce in, um, in addressing that. I think that they are probably absolutely a lot more proficient than maybe I'm describing because I'm wanting to give you the profile of the cases where it's not working, mm -hmm. and um, but I hear I hear you. And I, to be completely clear, I live in a district and I live in a county that supplies the majority of the workforce for one of our facilities, and I hear the frustration, and I see their apathy in which they share their stories of things that should have been investigated and never were. Are you talking about the staff or the I'm talking about staff okay. right now. And you see their apathy? Yes. I they can say I can report this ten times a day and it will never go anywhere. So I've why am I reporting some of those it? similar things? Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying mm -hmm. to get at is we are doing a disservice mm -hmm. because our COs, the people who are there 18 hours a day working overtime non-stop are trying to help they are trying to make our prisons a better place and it is all for naught because it doesn't go anywhere there's no transparency there's no accountability for them to know that something is being done mm -hmm. and the fact that they see nothing leads to a culture where nobody says anything and that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're stuck in right now. Mm -hmm. That's where our public perception is. That's why we can't recruit people. That's why this is a really tough job. It's, it's not because our staff are incompetent, because it is the opposite. They give everything to this job. 
and I hear so many of them come back and say it's chewed them up and it's spit them out. So we're trying to really work on getting an in-depth knowledge of where we've been with Priya and within our facilities and understanding those reporting mechanisms and the chain of command and the responses. And um, I hear back home myself as well, the things are reported and then they don't hear anything back. Mm -hmm. They don't feel that people have, have their back. Mm -hmm. A lot of correctional officers don't feel that the ship, ship supervisors or the superintendents have their back. And that's a real culture issue that we should brought up, but also what you brought up. And, and I think this whole situation that has occurred through that article in, the, in seven days has really brought to light a real focus on what is DOC all about and what is the culture. And that's what we're going, that's the work we're going to be doing this session. And it's going to be way beyond a sexualized work environment. And that's why it's important to know the chain of command. And that's why the questions have been asked. And I understand that, yeah, you, you have a, <clears throat> a question of an inmate, now you doing something different. What can I help you with? Mm -hmm. you know, that's part of a correctional officer's job. But there is a boundary there, and are some of them going over their boundaries? And then when that occurs, what's the change? So that is the broad scope of what we're trying <coughs> to do. I'm going to move on to another question from another committee member. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll. I'll fall back to my easy question. <laughs> um, and anyway, uh, how much of this do you think has to do with the facility in that, let's take um, CRCF for, for example, how isolated are the corrections officers during the day? But, um, in, in terms of, do they interact enough that they would be able to spot this kind of behavior in each other? Or is, or is a correction officer said, okay, you're doing this unit, you're covering this unit for six hours, see you in six hours. Mm -hmm. And just then in terms of how the corrections officers interact, is, how does that work in, in the facility? Well, I think it's both. It can be very isolating, and there are opportunities to see things and to talk to each other. And, um, I don't think that uh, Chittenden is more isolating than any of the other facilities. And by isolating, I mean like you're, you know, you may be a, a few hours in a unit before you get a break. But there are several other opportunities that you would see staff in the staff lounge, or you're in meetings, or you go to trainings, and there's roll call, and there's passing each other in the hallway. That doesn't take away the challenges of. Um, your time in a unit and that again to, to speak to the culture and um, to all of your comments with regards to the sentiment that it feels like nothing's ever happening I appreciate you um, representative for um, reframing the question a few times and thank you chair Emmons for saying it as well um, that's a that is a reality that it's we don't know if I make if I report something I'm not necessarily gonna know that's also very isolating if I report something up the chain I might not know what the outcome is it's none of my business particularly if it's personnel I'm not gonna know the outcome the only quite frankly our staff have told us for years sometimes they don't know what the outcome is until that person doesn't come back to work again that's um, not it's not helpful it's uh, the reality of the personnel process it does add to uh, the isolation and also as I mean we're all pretty much the same in this area and that when we don't know what's happening we kind of make up the worst right and, and that that um, is something that we have to work on as well in addition the accountability at the top which is I think what you were referring to in terms of accountability we hear this in training um, 
pretty regularly that it's hard to know um, whether you, you know, we, we need to have a healthier loop in terms of feedback. It's hard to know when you're doing a good job. And um, that's attached to competency-based skills because that feedback loop needs to be happening regularly. And that helps with asking questions. Is that getting to your isolation a, a little yeah, bit? I, I think I, I was more the first part of that when you're actually talking about the facility. That's more my question. And the, and the rotation of, of corrections officers, whether they're on for six hours alone or whether they're two hours and then, or, or maybe there's more than one. I don't know how many are actually overseeing this unit. Sometimes I think it is only one person for Often, four. Often, yeah. Yes, and that, um, and that's across the board, and that that's an issue with the workforce is getting enough breaks, and um, I think that's uh, clearly we would hear from the staff and um, Director Howard's in here from BSEA. We've heard that from BSE with BSEA as well is that there's the nature of the work inside of a facility is getting in the way of retention efforts, and if you're waiting on a float to get a break. Um, that can be very uncomfortable just being able to use the restroom and we've got to get better at that so I, I want to get back to you're on a unit the same behavior for other I'm gonna I'm gonna do it with the work staff because I think that's more what this relates to so there's one could be a caseworker, it could be another correctional officer. There's obvious behaviors that that person's exhibiting that are red flags. Would would that then be a, a case or a situation that you would file an incident report? Or if we don't have a structure for incident reports, is that something we should start putting in place? I think we'd have to talk more about each specific behavior that um, we're describing. So I wouldn't necessarily um, say that any of the things that I have mentioned is an incident, if, if that makes sense. I think we need to be more, if you said, okay, a male corrections officer is taking, is getting together with a female inmate, specifically out of sight of cameras, and out of sight of anyone else, and is a person the, sees that. Is that does that trigger? <laughs> oh yeah, a higher level. Okay, that so is, that's, that's an incident report. Yeah, if you're submitted. not supposed to be, the, that's very obvious. You're not supposed so is there to be an there. incident report that is submitted in that kind of a situation. So I'm going to look over to Jen, but I think she's going to nod that you are going to report that and then be asked to write an incident report. So just for clarification. When staff use the phrase incident report, that is directly connected to our vendor <coughs> management system, which is our database for tracking inmate behavior. So when someone says incident report, that's generally what we're speaking to. It's inmate behavior, not staff behavior. <coughs> so would a, would a staff person write a report? Absolutely. But would they write the report about their colleague? Or yes. about the inmate? They would write a report about the colleague. They would write a report stating that they saw <coughs> officer so-and-so off camera with inmate so-and-so, and they would give that to their supervisor. And then what does the supervisor do with that? According to our, our policies, that would go directly to the superintendent. Mm -hmm. So where does the superintendent investigate it? That's where the investigation would then start. The so again, when we use the word investigation, are we are we doing something preliminarily to find out if there's indeed some, you know something going on here? Is this uh, is this going to lead us to a criminal investigation? Are we finding out more? Is this going over to personnel? Is it AHSIU? So there are different kinds of investigations. And who determines? <coughs> Which investigation it goes to? Which superintendent. Tenants? The superintendent is going to have a lot of communicating with the facilities exec over. This is what I, this is over what I have so far. Group? The facilities exec, Al Cormier, up okay. the chain, central okay, office, up the chain. Up okay. The chain. Okay. So there's a decision made. In the <coughs> investigation. 
that isn't <coughs> pursued through the Department of Human Resources is not pursued in a criminal arena. There's been a decision made, either through the facility executive, the superintendent. Does that decision then get relayed to the offending officer? Yes, if there was indeed something happening that shouldn't have been happening. They would circle back with that officer. It would be uh, feedback. And I don't know what kind of feedback. It would, you know, there's so many things that can influence okay. it. It could just, be a discussion. I'm just trying to see what the chain is and then how it loops back mm -hmm. to resolving the situation. Do the officers who filed the complaint or filed the investigation, are they made aware of the actions that were taken? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. No. Should they be? I don't know, because there's so many variables in this, right? Remember, I started by talking about things to pay attention to. Not everything that we pay attention to is an incident or is um, worthy of an investigation. Maybe it's, maybe it's a mistake <coughs> that requires a conversation. So it, uh, if the question is, should there always be loop back? Yes, I think so. I think we need to stay out of this vast gray area and deal with something which which is so this, an important. This is not a gray area that we were talking. Yeah, that, that's there what I mean. We need to, to talk about this specific incident that I described. Right. In that specific Being case, someplace would, that you shouldn't be. Yeah, okay. off camera with a female inmate, uh, a corrections officer. That goes to the superintendent. If if yeah. the superintendent and the executive decide that something should happen, an investigation should be done, um, and. I'm not sure what this does. The person who reported it know that anything has happened, <coughs> that the superintendent contacted the executive or not? Do the, is there any report back directly to that one who reported the incident of the of the officer and the inmate? Not, nece not necessarily. It's a okay. personnel case. So if I report another personnel behavior, I don't necessarily know what the outcome's going to be. Okay. It's so there's not nothing in directives or nothing in policy that says that person has to be informed. If they ask, if they say, did anything happen to that report that I put in? They ask the superintendent or the shift supervisor, do they usually get an answer? Or, do they, or is there a policy that says we're not supposed to tell you and we're... <laughs> What's the term? There's an ins there's an investigation going on. I can't say anything <laughs> since you reported. Yeah, I, the idea is that um, as the employee, I have the right to have my privacy protected while you while people look into this. Right, but this in this specific case that we're describing, is there something that says that employee, the person who reported it, should not be told what's happened, or can they be told what has happened? If they ask, they w no, they don't have the right to know anything. I'm gonna look at okay. Steve. Is that correct? Right. Is that part of the okay. union? Is that part of the contract, or is that part of? It's personnel policy. It's personnel yeah. policy with the whole state. It's not yeah. just DOC. Correct. Yeah. And I, again, I'm not trying to like dodge the question. It's just that we. No, I, un I understand how complicated it is, but we're trying to just okay. understand a specific s series of steps in a specific incident. So, so. And and I think you've answered. Candidly, I mean, the third person doesn't have to be told. Right. That's fine. That's the answer to the question. But they so here's the thing, they may find out when they don't come back to work. Or if they are arrested. Yeah, yeah. Or if they resign. But in and fact, they don't have to be told. There's nothing no. in the policy that's, and matter of fact, there's policy that says they shouldn't be told. Yeah, and, so, and that, if I can just appeal to the committee in terms of how difficult this is, that's heart wrenching part of this work. Often you are not seeing someone that you like, that you're friends with, or perhaps didn't do anything wrong who's not coming back to work. This, I don't take this lightly. This is a gut-wrenching portion of, of the job, that you may not see somebody, and maybe you trusted them, maybe you went fishing with them or shopping with them, and you were tight, and now they're not there, and they didn't, you literally don't know whether they have done something that they shouldn't have or not, and you won't know until it's over, which is why we hear from the BSCA very regularly that these investigations that go on forever are debilitating emotionally, and I agree. <coughs> 
They are. It can be mind-numbing. And then, of course, uh, the person who reports it's likely going to be a witness. So now you're a witness, and that's not easy either. This, you sign up to do a job, and the job is, you know, people will tell you when they go to the academy, we ask them, why do you, you know, why do you want to do this work? I, because I believe people can change. Because I care about my state. Because I'm interested in criminal justice and criminal justice reform. Because I like working with people. All those answers. It isn't until you are sitting in the mud of that that you say to yourself, I did not know I was going to be a witness in a personnel investigation three times a year. Or that I might be falsely accused of something so embarrassing it's, I can't, it's unspeakable. Or that I've made a mistake that I've been afraid that I'm going to betray my friends. Like the, all of these are very human, um, very um, painful parts of this work. That in when you put them all in one group, of make up our culture, which is why it's so hard. And it's very hard to hear that we're not holding anyone accountable. But I understand why people the public or committee members or anyone else might think that we don't because if it looks like that and we know how powerful perception is if it looks like that it's real, it's real. perception is real and that feeling of nothing ever happens is not new, that is not new to me and it's not the first time I've heard it and I've heard it my career, my entire career and I have personally felt it and professionally experienced it but if you don't know you don't don't know. And that's where we're from. We don't know. Mm -hmm. That's why we're Understood. asking the questions we are to kind of help. It's Understood. Cold. So Carl, Linda, and Marsha. Um, I just want to follow this thread a little bit more. I got a couple more questions. So uh, there's a CO in main control and while they're unlocking doors and monitoring the or looking at the video monitors they just happen, incidentally, to notice a CO and an inmate go off camera. That that would be a reportable. Yeah. That would be a reportable incident. Okay. What? So they they've got to report that to the shift supervisor. What would prevent the ship shift supervisor? Is that a written report or is it? How does that? What's what does that look like? Well, again. Off camera, meaning I'm assuming what you mean is they're going someplace together they shouldn't be. So it is equally likely that someone's going to say, where are you going? That, that's a possibility. Okay. Additionally, um, they may go to the, um, the, shift su the shift supervisor and they can go up the chain and get assistance with whatever it is that they're doing. There are lots of ways to not be in the right Place and that what you're describing sounds like it might be a little more obvious. So it might the, yeah, it, just, the intervention might right. be more imminent. That more imminent. But let's say let's say the shift supervisor was busy at that time, and the person in central control is is busy too. They've got a zillion different things to do. They they're busy unlocking doors. They can't for whatever reason. They relate to the shift supervisor 15 minutes later, half an hour later. What prevents, and let's just say the shift supervisor goes and investigates it, but what, what would prevent the shift supervisor from not doing anything or burying it or not responding? Nothing would prevent him or her. <coughs> what I mean by that is that I cannot get in everyone's head. Right, no, I, this yeah, is no. A, I just want just want to ask just want to if the if the if the CO in control made a report I guess that I'm just getting at that at that piece of the well we don't you know we don't know that anything was ever done well let, let's piece. let me reframe and say um, you know, obviously we can't control everyone's behavior all the time and we can't list every single thing that someone should report in terms of concerning behavior because we would never finish the list but the bottom line is this this is a prison 
and everyone is inside and the doors are locked. So what would prevent a supervisor from not saying anything is that it's dangerous not to and that it's dangerous for everyone mm -hmm. in there if nothing is said. So there's an, a, there's, there is a collective goal that when you see something inside a prison that is concerning and that is concerning, I can't think of a reason why we wouldn't do something about it because it puts potentially everybody in danger, which is um, really at the heart of why we manage all these, um, not just behaviors, but we have the guidance attached, uh, documents attached to the directive so folks know what to do when they see something. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm just trying to, trying to get, and I, and I, I know you're, you're answering these questions, and the, these questions might be.